Jaws is the breakthrough. Yet again, I think it's a question of realism. Imagine if all of this had been shot in a studio water tank and we wouldn't have had the wide expanse of the horizons signaling the isolation of the characters. The movie wouldn't have been nearly as good. It's a really subtle visual element that is completely indispensable for the tension of the movie and Spielberg is entirely clear on this. It's very important that no matter what direction my cameras turned, I didn't want to see land. I felt my fear was the minute the audience saw land, They'd say, look, this is getting pretty intense out here. Just turn the boat around and go toward that land that we keep seeing in your movie. With that single decision, Spielberg may well have been to blame for some of the production difficulties with the movie, but it paid off even if it didn't look like it would. Jaws is, of course, one of the most interesting movies of all time, completely apart from its role in Spielberg's work, simply because, judging from its legendary production, it should have been the least successful movie ever made, and it turned out to be the most successful movie ever made. And it's really not because of the groundbreaking shark effects. We come close to defining a central part of Spielberg's cinematic thinking, which we can call, for lack of a better term, the dynamic between the visible and the hidden. It's interesting that Spielberg came up with this scene with the end of the pier at the script stage before he knew that the shark wasn't going to work. Here he is describing another idea that works according to the same principles. I had this idea that there's a harbor master and he's in his little shack and there's all these sailboats. It's night and there's about 20 sailboats with just their masts sticking up. One mast starts to go like this. And then the mast and the ship next to it, that mast goes like this. And then the third mast goes like this. And the fourth mast. Until all of a sudden you see in sequential order, all, something is traveling beneath the keels. As the harbor master goes down to clean out his coffee pot in the harbor, and as he gets down to clean out his coffee pot, he, of course, is taken. This has been referred to as the principle that the scary thing is what you don't see. I thought that what could really be scary was not seeing the shark. I think it's more accurate to say that the scary thing is that something implies something else. The thing we see stands in relation to something we don't see, and that relationship is in itself scary. This dynamic also applies to the framing itself, where we have the scary thing and the reaction to the scary thing in the same frame. We can call this premiering staging above editing, and it's one of Spielberg's hallmarks. At his best, Spielberg makes the entire sea feel like it's conspiring to hide the shark. Spielberg phrases this beautifully. The audience didn't trust me after the first scream, at the end of the first act. And then they were looking out for shadows and things coming out from behind things. Trust is perfectly put. The mistrust the audience has for Spielberg is exactly the same thing a hyper-imaginative person like Spielberg has for the sea itself, which is probably why he really wanted to make the film and why he was exactly the right person to make it. In that way, the breakdown of the shark played right into his hands in that it freed him to rely on the techniques that he's intuitively drawn to anyway. As Spielberg himself said, the fact that the shark didn't work probably added a great deal to the box office. But that's not all. The thing that truly elevates Jaws beyond the well-made but essentially silly B-movie it by all rights should be is the characters. Here's a question. Why does Quint have to die? My main problem with Duel was that the protagonist David Mann didn't feel entirely sympathetic, despite being bullied by everyone. Spielberg can relate to being bullied, and he has said that all of his early movies about people being pursued by indomitable forces was about his fear of the bullies coming after him. The notion of revenge of the nerds is writ large all over Duel, and we can kind of sense it in the opening of Jaws as well, where Spielberg shows us a bunch of trendy young people who he clearly feels he doesn't belong to and who he's kind of lining up as bait for the shark. Chief Brody, however, has none of this. Roy Scheider is just a marvel of sympathy all the way through. We can wager that if Spielberg had made a Jaws 30 years later, Tom Hanks would have played him. And in Catch Me If You Can, he kind of does. And Richard Dreyfuss, while a smartass, is genuinely charming in his oddball passion for sharks. The lovely thing about the relationship between them is that they can build a mutual respect on being outsiders. Doesn't make much sense for a guy who hates the water to live on an island, either. It's the first in a line of wonderful unlikely bromances in Spielberg, continuing with Liam Neeson and Ben Kingsley in Schindler's List, and maybe even Tom Hanks and Mark Rylands in Bridge of Spies. Quint, however, is a bully. He's kind of the antagonist of the film, and that's why he has to die while Dreyfus gets to live. I really love this movie, and it's not so much thanks to the adventure on the high seas, great as that is, as I just kind of like to sit at this table, listening to Scheider say, I can do anything, I'm the chief of police. 
never gets old. The principle of ordinary objects implying a presence of some kind certainly applies to close encounters as well, which is also a masterwork, even though an ambiguous one. I think it's been unfairly overshadowed by E.T., and while E.T. is more accessible, I think Close Encounters the more profound work, simply because of its ambiguity. Why are the aliens both scary and benign? Spielberg says that the enduring image that remains with him from Close Encounters is the iconic one of the little child opening the door. When I designed the shot and when I wrote it in the script, for me that was very symbolic of what only a child can do, is to trust the light. What that interestingly forgets is the tone of abject dread throughout that entire scene. I remember I was shocked by it when I first saw it because I didn't understand why Spielberg wanted to make the aliens he clearly sees as a benign force so frightening. And they remained pretty frightening all the way up to the end. William's music signals fear pretty consistently throughout this last scene, or at least wavers between fear and rapture. What does this music express to you, for instance? <laughs> There's certainly the thrill of discovery there, but there's also a yearning so strong that it might become destructive. That yearning and its destructiveness, I think, is at the heart of Close Encounters. It's infinitely to the credit of Spielberg that he allows that destructiveness to coexist with his benign vision. And the fact that we don't return to Roy Neary's abandoned family doesn't diminish the impact they make. I mean, as frightening as the child abduction scene is, I kind of think this scene is worse. Right now, we're, we're going. Come on. Come on. Let's go with it. I always want Terry Gar, who plays the wife here, to be a bit more freaked out than she is because Dreyfus is being so frighteningly delusional. I cheer for her when she does the right thing and gets the kids out of there, at the same time as I secretly relish the image of Dreyfus breaking up the monotony of suburbia by just trashing his house with complete abandon. It's no coincidence that the alien visitation awakens the artistic impulse in him. Something opens up his imagination to go for something that he thinks is going to provide some cathartic answer. He was an artist trying to plumb the depths of his imagination. It's basically Spielberg's portrait of the artist as a young man. The fact that Spielberg contrasts that familial discord with the wondrous light of the aliens is what is so captivating, and it gives a backside to these otherworldly creatures that explains why they should also be as frightening as they are. Sure, they come to restore some families, but also to break up others. Spielberg has of course said that if he had done Close Encounters today, he wouldn't have allowed Dreyfus to leave his family. But I think it's extremely important for the intensity of the movie that he lets himself leave. It doesn't make him a good father, but it makes his yearning more irresistible. Speaking of light, Spielberg seems to have a fascination with light in an almost abstract sense. He renders his extraterrestrial visitation in what he calls a symphony of light and sound and emotion. He describes the inspiration for this. You know, I used to park my car, I guess, on Airport Boulevard near LAX, and I used to watch all the planes all stacked up out to, into in the sky, you know, coming in one after the other five miles apart. And I used to watch that and say, God, wouldn't that be amazing if I could get that same effect coming into the final zone at the Devil's Tower in Wyoming. It's a lovely image, Spielberg watching the planes coming in at night and letting that work on his imagination. What are those lights? What could they mean? What could they be? The ambiguity of those lights at a distance is the visual tension that powers Close Encounters, just like the visual tension of the sea and what it's hiding powers Jaws. For instance, if I could ever come up with anything as brilliant as this in my life, I wouldn't really have to do anything else. Alright, let me stop you here. The signal circuits lead you right to nowhere. 